So in today's video, I want to go over practical tokenomics. I think it's an area that people glide over and they don't spend enough time on. Now, tokenomics is critical to a good investment. Bad tokenomics can result in a solid project being a poor investment for yourself. And you want to also avoid things like VCs, insiders, and you know, influencers holding most of the tokens and then dumping on you. So if you've been following my channel, you'll know that I care a lot about fundamental analysis. The team behind the project, the technology, the community. I also look at some technical analysis for a good entry. Now, before I get started, remember that none of this is financial or investment advice. The crypto market is extremely risky and most people lose their money. Furthermore, please do your own due diligence research before you get into anything. Finally, none of this is sponsored content. I'll always disclose if I have a position in a specific project and if it is a sponsor video I would tell you up front. Now with that out of the way, let's get started. Now remember the price of any asset is determined by its demand and supply. In tokenomics that is also true. We're first going to talk about supply tokenomics. So the supply that's controlled by the team and how they release it. And then we're going to look at the demand side. What is the demand for this asset for this cryptocurrency? So let's first start with the supply side. There are six key core principles that you need to understand. Number one is the maximum supply. Two is the circulating supply. Three is the market cap or M cap. Four is the fully diluted valuation, it's FDV. Number five is the token distribution. And then number six is the token vesting schedule. So all of those principles will allow us to understand the tokenomics much better and give us a much greater feel for how this project is. So understanding these six core principles will allow you to determine if this is a fair tokenomics or if the team is looking to dump on us. So the max supply is the maximum number of coins to ever exist. These are all the coins that were created by the project. The circulating supply is the number of coins that are circulating right now in the open market. So you can find all of this data on CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko. And if we pull up any token, in this case AVEX or Avalanche, you can see that the max supply is 715 million and then the circulating supply is 392 million. Although we don't use it a lot, sometimes you may see this total supply. The total supply is very simple. It's simply the maximum number of coins that were created minus all of the ones that they've taken out of circulation or burned. So when we take a look at a project, we want to make sure that it has a max supply. So in Bitcoin's case, right over here, the most famous project of all of them has only 21 million tokens. That's all of the Bitcoin that there will ever be. Nobody can create anymore. And that's why a lot of people gravitate towards Bitcoin because you cannot inflate the supply, therefore reducing the value of each coin. Now, in some projects, there is no cap on the max supply. It doesn't necessarily mean the projects are bad. Two of my favorite projects, Solana, right over here, if you notice, there is no cap on the maximum supply. It's infinite. So that means that the inflation, they can continue to print Solana tokens based on the project. And if we look at Ethereum or ETH, it's exactly the same. There's an infinite supply. Theoretically, they can continue to print tokens, therefore decreasing the value of the token. However, there are burn mechanisms or deflationary tokenomics. If we come right over here onto ultrasound money, we can see a perfect example of a burn mechanism and deflationary tokenomics because ETH demonstrates it well. Notice that over 619 days since the merge right over here, the token supply has actually been going down. Notice that per year, the token growth is actually into its negative, okay? And this is the burn right over here, what I spoke about earlier, some tokenomics we can burn those tokens out of circulations if the project decides to do so. So hopefully that clarified the max and circulating supply. And also in general, we want to look for projects where there's a max cap on the max number of tokens that they can print. And then if there is an infinite supply, we want to check it out to see if there's deflationary tokenomics burn mechanisms to help decrease the inflation rate. Now compare this to a real life example of a project where there's an infinite supply that we've all bought into is the US dollar. Notice the US dollar can be inflated and printed every single year. If you check out this graph right over here, the CPI curve, it shows that we've lost that purchasing power over the last 100 years. And the reason why the feds and the government keep on printing money is because when you take a look at the debt, it's now up to 34 trillion. When you see the numbers jump like this, you know that they are printing hard. So next concept is market cap. 
Now, the practical definition of market cap is simply how valuable that project is, how valuable that stock, that cryptocurrency is. The literal definition is simply the circulating supply times by the price gives you the market cap. If we come back to the AVAX example right over here, if you take the circulating supply, which is 392 million tokens, multiply by the current price, $36.81, you get a market cap of $14.4 billion. Now, the market cap is an important idea because when we're looking at projects and looking at the potential gain, let's say AVAX right over here. Can AVAX do a 10x gain? Is that realistic? Going from 14 billion to 140 billion. Well, in the last market cycle, AVAX has touched that. But if you're looking to go for 100x, if you take a look at AVAX right now, from 14 billion, it has to go to 1.4, 1.5 trillion for you to get 100x. Is that possible? Yes. Is that realistic? Definitely not. And the reason why I say it's unreasonable is because Bitcoin right now is only 1.35 trillion. AVAX would have to surpass the market cap of Bitcoin and the entire crypto market is only 2.3 trillion so AVAX would make up more than half of it. To give you an idea about how big and ridiculous that has to be, if you take a look at the real world, notice Visa, Walmart, and ExxonMobil, they're all roughly $500 billion so it's 1.5 trillion for all three of them. AVAX would have to dwarf these three massive companies in order to get to that valuation. So using market cap as a tool and having realistic expectations, you can decide where your best exit strategy will be and what your expectations for how far projects will go. Now, if you want the 100X, you have to take more risks. It can't be big projects like this. So one of the projects that I hold, if you've been following the channel, you know it's Topia. Topia is extremely small right now. If you take a look at its market cap, it's only 30 something million. So a 10X from here would be 360 million and then a 100X from here would be 3.6 billion. Billion. And then finally, the actual price that the project is trading on. If you take a look at Bitcoin right over here, for new DGENs, you know, getting out $68,000, $69,000 per coin optically is a bad thing to them. They feel like it's too expensive because they haven't looked at the tokenomics. Whereas when they stare at something like Bonk, where it's 0.00003, they feel optically that it is cheap. Without understanding the tokenomics, they're more likely to buy something that has a lower price. So would you rather hold 290 4 million worth of bonk versus a 0.14 of Bitcoin. And you can certainly see why a lot of newbies who come into a market prefer to buy meme coins. So the fully diluted valuation, or FDV for short, is the max supply times by the price of the coins that are out there right now. So going back to our AVAX example, you can see the FDV is 26 billion. You get that by multiplying the max supply, 715 million, by the current price right now of $36. So the FDV is an important value. It'll tell me right away if the project is trying to play games or trying to optically make their token look cheaper. What I mean by this is that most projects who do this will release only a small amount of tokens into circulation. Therefore, you think the price is cheap with a low market cap value. If you take a look at this example right over here, gaming is one of the perfect examples. If you take a look at the price right now, it's only 0.005, giving it a market cap of 34 million. Now, when you take a look at its FDV, it's 523 million. That's more than 10 times the value of the current market cap. And the reason why that is because if you look at max supply, there's a 100 billion GMRX token, but they've only released 6.6 .6 billion, only 6% of the supply. So we're going to expect the remaining 94% to come into circulation, therefore diluting the value and price. The other example that exemplifies this is the WorldCoin token WLD. If you take a look at its tokenomics right over here, the current market cap is only 1 billion, whereas the FDV, the fully diluted value, is 45 billion, making it 45 more times. The reason for this is if you take a look at the circulating coin right over here, it's only 222 million of the 10 billion tokens, okay? So that makes it less than 2% supply. And as much hype and buzz around this project, notice right over here, they're integrating with Minecraft, Reddit, Telegram, Shopify, Mercado Libre. And then if you go down here, you'll notice that one of the founders of the token, if you didn't know, was actually Sam Altman. Okay, so this is one of his projects. So there is a big hype around this, but with those types of tokenomics, I'm not going anywhere near this with a 10 foot pole. So that's why it's important to understand FDV and take it seriously. It's a really valuable tool. In general, I only look for things that are between 5 to 8x at most, 10x, and you're really pushing it. And if you take a look at the allocation numbers, you'll see that most projects allocate in a percentage to one of these categories. So first off, starting with teams. So the team needs some incentives. Usually they allocate themselves between 15 and 20%. 
advisors, two to five percent, early investors, twenty to twenty-five percent. Those are the seed, you know, private sales, strategic rounds, KOL rounds, institutional rounds. The public sale is usually very small, between two to five percent. These are the IDOs, the ICOs, the IEOs. They're all the same. They're launched through Launchpad to retail investors. The marketing sometimes it's five to ten percent. Ecosystem between ten to twenty percent. That includes like community staking, airdrops, rewards, etc. Liquidity. So for centralized exchange, the CXF, and then the DEX is the decentralized exchange like Uniswap. The treasury gets some form, and then finally the foundation. So you may see a foundation getting a percentage of the tokens. So some of the tools I really like to look at the allocation is Crypto Rank. If you take a look at Crypto Rank right over here, here is a Mavia. If you go down, you can see they lay it out in a nice table right over here. You can see all the numbers, who gets what, and how much do they get. The other tool that I use that I like is Coin Gecko. You can see on Coin Gecko they break it down pretty nice for you. Most of the categories we talked about. Airdrop, private sales, strategic partners, you know, community and developer. The foundation, right over here, you have public sale B and then public sale option A2. Finally, team and then staking rewards. And then also the mechanism in terms of how to distribute the tokens. One is a fair launch, meaning that all the tokens will be given to the community members. I like fair launches the most, but they're also not realistic for all projects because some projects definitely need to raise capital in order to run their operation. An example of a fair launch that I really like is the Robit token. Now, if those of you who've been following the channel, you know that. I really like Robit as well. If you take a look at their website right over here, what I really like is 100% of the RLB, so that's the Robit token, is distributed to Robit users. There was no ICO or any Robit that was sold over the counter to anybody. So that's an example of a fair launch that I really like. And if we take a look at Robit's initial distribution, I really like it because 77% of it was given to stakers, and then the remaining 23% is given as airdrops and rewards. So all of it went to the community. And the other example I really like was Urine Finance's distribution and fair launch to the community. So to summarize allocation, I don't want to see a huge percentage in the team's hand or you know the VCs, people who can dump on the community. I'd like to see it more spread out and a lot more lean towards the community. If you go back to this chart, you notice that the Mavia token, you know in Heroes of Mavia, I talked about this project before. I like its tokenomics because it kind of fits in with that box. It's not the best tokenomics, but it's also not the worst tokenomics as well. You notice right over here, the community and ecosystem gets almost half of it, 44%. The team gets 22%, you know, pre-sale was 15%, and then advisors were 3%, between that 2 and 5% that I spoke about. So that's what I mean about looking at the distribution of the tokenomics. Finally, the vesting schedule. The vesting schedule simply means the amount of tokens that were allocated and when they are released over a period of time. So in this section, I just want you to understand three key definitions. TGE, the token generation event, the cliff, what is it, and then the emission schedule. To explain these concepts, I'm gonna use the ILV, the Alluvium token, also another one of my favorite projects. Now TGE just simply means token generation event. It means that on day one, when the token starts to trade, how much of the token is available? If you take a look at Alluvium right over here, you can see that the seed round, right? The ILV people who have 15% of the tokens, on token generation event, none of it is unlocked. Whereas the public sale, the 10% of the Alluvium tokens that were sold on day one, 100% of it is unlocked, allowing people to trade right away. You can see right over here, I like the CTG of zero for the team, you know, the pre-seed, all the people who could theoretically dump on the project and have no further incentive to continue the project. Now, as a part of the vesting schedule, you'll hear the word cliff a lot. What is it? If you take a look right over here, if TGE is time zero, so right over here, the cliff is the time period right after the TGE until the next token unlock. So if you notice for the seed round people, they have zero unlocks right on day one, followed by a cliff of one year. What does that mean? Well, between March of 2021 to March of 2022, there's a lockup period where no tokens become unlocked. Only after that date, when they start unlocking tokens. So that's when we get into the emission schedule. So the emission schedule is really important to know because you want to know where those unlocks are and when the token can possibly take a hit if they're unlocking way too many tokens. In general, if you take a look right over here onto the ILV token, notice that earlier in the start, there's not a lot of emissions, not a lot of unlocks, but as you go along, more and more tokens are being unlocked. As a general rule, I look between month to month, and if there's a 1-2% to 2 unlock, 
that should probably be okay. But if there's a huge unlocking during that month, I know that there may be a hit to the token's price and the token price may suffer. And if we take a look at Mavia's token right over here, its release or emission schedule, I really like that they are transparent. Is the team being transparent with us and showing us the emission schedule properly? So if you notice right over here from May 2024 to August 2024, and then as you go on, Okay, November 2024, it shows you how many tokens are being unlocked. So between here and here, it's 13.23%. Total circulating supply to here, it's only 13.8. And as you go on, the unlocks become a little bit more aggressive. Now, in, from February to May, okay, that's three months' time, you're going from 20.6% to about 25, okay? So that's about a 4%, 5% unlock so that's a huge unlock and if you go from here to here notice you're going from 25 to 29 as well into august so every single three month it's about a five percent unlock so if you divide it month to month it's only a one to two percent unlock so i think it should be okay but as you could see as you go along the unlockings will get more and more so more tokens are entering the circulation therefore we're having a dilution in price if there's no increase in demand so it is key to watch these emission schedule these release schedules because it can give us a chance to take a step back and see where is it possible for a great entry. So if you have a lot of inflation, you don't want to buy in at the start because those tokens are going to get diluted. But once all the dilution has occurred and the price is very stable, that's probably a good time for a good entry if the price is not too high. And finally, you notice that in this chart, it goes from 2024 to 2029. In general, I'd like to see at least a three to five year vesting schedule. That way I know that the insiders, you know, the founders along with early investors are not going to dump on us. And it gives it a good time frame so that the tokens are released over time so that the demand can meet the supply that is coming to the market. Of course, it's important to recognize that there's also a demand side to tokenomics. In general, the demand side is really straightforward. Has the project created real world use cases so that there's a demand for tokens? And when I say real world uses, I'm not talking about just governance and voting. Almost every single tokenomics talks about governance and voting as if it's, you know, the greatest thing since Coca-Cola. Well, it's not, okay? so. Take a look at real life examples. So if we take a look at a project like ETH that has real case uses. Even though ETH is an infinite supply, why does the price get hold up? Well, there's real uses. Number one is you need ETH to pay for gas fees. You need ETH to interact with different dApps like Uniswap, trading, doing everything else on the Ethereum chain is expensive, but you need it in order to interact with the chain. So on really good projects, they'll create a lot of utility for the token. Some have stakings that you can earn rewards from the token by holding onto the token. So there's got to be some value back to the users in order for there to be the demand that meets the supply. Because if there's absolutely no demand and it's just all this governance stuff, you can bet that the supply is going to dwarf that demand and eventually price will suffer. So let's summarize all the information that we learned today with a practical example. Now I've already started talking about this example, so it's not new, but it's the coin Robit. I really like Robit for a lot of things. If we go to the chart right over here, it's trading at seven cents right now at 191 million market cap. So if you see it's fully diluted market value right over here, it's FTV. It's exactly the same as its market cap. That's a great metrics that it met. It's circulating supply right now, okay? And it's total supply, if you take a look right over here, we talked about these things. While it's max supply is only five billion, it's more than 50% of the way there already. The other really cool thing about Robit is its burn mechanism and deflationary tokenomics. If you take a look right over here in 30 days, the casino revenue is 22 million. The crypto futures revenue is 4.8 million, and then the 30-day sports revenue is roughly 4 million. When you go down, you see the 30-day roll bit burn. So what they're basically doing is they're buying back the token and then burning it. Okay, so roughly $3.9 million, about $4 million of tokens that are being burnt. So if you take a look right over here, the burnt row bit is 47.44%. So in essence, the circulating row bit right over here is only 2.6 billion, which is the total supply, right? Because the original supply was 5 billion, we're burning away almost 2.4 billion, we have 2.6 billion. So its tokenomics and burn mechanism is one to marvel at and want to take a really close look at because this is the way it should be to bring back value to the token holders or the shareholders of this Robit coin. The other thing that we really like about Robit was that none of it was sold to insiders. 100% of it went towards the community. 
Okay, so that wraps it up for this video. I hope that you found some practical use and value in this topic. So if you like this video and content like this, please consider subscribing and I will see you next time.